Let me start by introducing my esteemed panel. Uh, on my immediate right, Tamar uh, Frumkin. Uh, so Tamar has uh, extensive experience with startups, uh, especially um, given her time in Tel Aviv where uh, she began her career. Um, most recently, she was the Director of Communications at Converse Social, a social engagement platform helping businesses increase customer loyalty by enabling effortless, in-the-moment customer service uh, through social and mobile channels. Uh, on her right is Rachel Moranis. Rachel has nearly 20 years of experience in B2B marketing within the digital media and technology space. As CMO of Olapic, Rachel leads global revenue marketing and communication strategies focusing on driving demand from the world's largest brands and retailers and growing Olapic's leadership position within the visual earned content industry. And finally on the uh, end, Mercha Baldin, uh, Mercha is the CEO and founder of MeetVibe, a mobile and Internet of Things company enabling proximity and micro-location interactions. And Mercha has held numerous digital strategy roles in both the software and financial services industries. So uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, we're going to talk to you today about integrated marketing and the omni-channel customer. So th for the purposes of today's discussion, w we are defining um, Integrated marketing is a blend of traditional and emerging marketing spanning on online and offline with multiple customer touch points, but we want to make sure that uh, we highlight that we do not see this as integrated marketing as being strictly about broadcast, one direction with the customer, uh, one direction in terms of messaging anymore. It's more of an exchange, a dialogue with customers as a result uh, as a result of things such as the rise of social media, user-generated content, the rise of influencer marketing, and audience fragmentation. So with that in mind, let's jump into the questions. So I'm going to begin with, uh, with Rachel. Um, if we build on the idea of audience fragmentation and customer choice uh, in terms of where and how they engage, uh, an example, you know, mobile versus website versus uh, offline, what, from your perspective, do companies need to do to ensure successful execution? Uh, and uh, with that in mind, what about measurement as well? Perfect. Can you hear me? Does this work? Yes? Yes. <laughs> Not sure if it's a night brace or what. But, um, so before I answer the question, I always like to know uh, who I'm talking to. So can you guys, by show of hands, let me know how many of you are B2B marketers? OK, and B2C marketers? Okay, so it's a fair split. Okay, great. Um, all right, so fragmentation, understanding your customer. So I think the, the first step in all of this is um, really understanding what, who your customer is, what your customer wants from you as a brand, um, and where the channels are that they're going to look for this. So it's, it's, a, you know, it, it's, it's not only um, a who aware, but it's also a how they want to be engaged with. Um, Measurement, I think, today is probably one of the, and it's probably been a topic all day long and yesterday for this crew, but I, I think it's one of the most challenging um, things for marketers because we do have such a broad um, array of channels that we are trying to find our consumer on. Um, from a B2B perspective, we look at the different personas that we are trying to sell to, and we cater to those personas differently in different channels and with different content and try and tailor the experience to exactly what that persona is looking for. Um, you know, and again, measurement, I think it, that's the holy grail that I haven't completely figured out. Um, right now we're very focused on um, first and last touch, but it's really the journey that we're trying to dive deeper into. Um, and, you know, and I think that's probably our biggest challenge today. Is part of the issue with measurement just building on that word journey, is that the, there's gaps in the journey where there's da missing data points? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the channels aren't as interconnected as, you know, as we like to think they are, as, a, as we would hope they are. Um, you know, I always think, as, as a marketer, I always think of myself as a consumer. And, you know, there are some places that I identify myself and there are some places that I don't. Um, and that makes it very difficult for brands, um, you know, and marketers to cover you throughout the journey. Great, thank you. Um, Tamar, given your experience in customer service software, 
uh, what factors would you say foster uh, consistency of message? Uh, or, you know, on the opposite, you know, may have led to a breakdown, kind of building on that uh, part about, you know, the missing gaps of, of measurement. Yeah, well, I think the fact that all customers are on the channel, I mean, we, I prefer to uh, refer to it as mobile, we're mobile customers, because pretty much we spend most of our time on, most of our time on the mobile phone, on social channels, on messaging channels, um, scrolling through whatever Facebook news site that you may be on. So the challenge is, is showing up with that customer expectation being so high for, on each of these channels. So you're not only competing with people, your direct competitors in your space, but you're competing with the customer experience that your customers are getting from Uber, from Apple, from whomever. That's where the bar is. So I think that's a big challenge for brands. And also trying to be everywhere but not doing it well. So you can be on every channel possible, but if you're not actually showing up, if the messaging isn't relevant, if you're not engaging in a compelling way, you know, it might be better to pare down the channels you're actually on. I see that as being especially difficult under brands when they are distributed. By that I mean with franchises, where the brand promises up here, mm -hmm. but the brand experience by the consumer and customer if I, you know, Applebee's makes a promise up here and I walk into an Applebee's and I have com something completely different mm -hmm. from what the brand promise was, well, then I often go to social and say, well, you know, thanks for messing up the promise. <laughs> um, curious to, to hear from all of you, and, and we'll, we'll start with Mercha on the end. With all the, uh, and just building on this concept of customer, with all the customer data available, even though there might be some gaps, but with all the, the customer data available, to, um, are marketing, marketers doing a good job of tailored or personalized marketing to the omni-channel customer? And I'm curious to know whether you think yes or no and, and, and why. So um, first of all, I think we have two different concepts there. Um, 90, 80 to 90 percent of the decisions are still being made in store today. And that means it's either you know, routine purchases, impulse buying, uh, in the moment. The other 20, 25% of the purchases are indeed research, right? So we're looking at uh, two fundamental um, experiences. When I'm in store, I want to buy as soon as possible. I want to be in and out of the store while avoiding other shoppers. Whereas I do want to take my time uh, to do my research when I buy something more, more expensive. So fundamentally, there are two different things. Um, one of the things that we are really excited about being a, a mobile first company is bridging this gap through uh, proximity technology. Proximity can actually uh, reach consumers on the ground in the moment, uh, adding this additional contextual layer when I'm about to make a decision. So I, th I'd, I'd argue, I think what you said before earlier was that 90% is happening in store, but I would, I would argue that 70 or 80 percent is researched prior to that purchase. There's been there. Are, there's a Deloitte study. I don't know if anyone else has read it. Where I forget they named it something a digital something something, um, which was a study on how much consumers are researching prior to coming to the store and buying in the digital effect or something to that. It's also B two B. We know that 70 yes. percent of the sales process. That for sure, 100 yeah, yeah. percent. Right. But this was a consumer. Um, research survey that they Hopefully done. someone will tweet it out with the hashtag <laughs> yeah. for us later. Yeah. So depending <laughs> depending on the nature of the product, yeah. I can change my mind. I can I can be influenced in store. I can be sent a coupon. I can send a discount. Yeah. Um, what we do, we also collect analytics uh, in terms of on the ground interaction. So if you're notice, uh, noticing that people are spending more time in front of a booth, mm -hmm. in front of a stand, you can actually, hey, send a, a, a discount right. right away. And that can actually influence and, and uh, tilt. It's all about personalization. Exactly. But, the, but to your point, that's personalization rather than research. That's in the yeah. moment, yeah. 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 Data-based yeah. personalization. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and uh, what was your thought? So I'm coming from more of a B2B place, right. um, although I have worked in B2C. I, personalization is nice, and I worked for a company called Insight Terra. If anyone's familiar, Marketo acquired them. They do the top funnel personalization. So before you actually have the customer's um, email, you can personalize based on where they're from, what industry they work in, uh, all these great um, seg segmenting uh, data points. I find that although persona-based marketing is powerful, 
the most powerful thing you can have is something that's relevant, data-driven, and valuable to who you're speaking to. So if you're producing content and telling stories that are compelling, that are different, that's going to be your most valuable asset when trying to, to reach out to the omni-channel customer. It, does that warrant, uh, they talk about the trade-off between I'm willing to give a certain amount of personal information for that relevancy. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that in some cases in the competitive landscape we're ratcheting up the relevance but we're, there's an expectation by marketers that we expect a ton of data from the, from the, uh, on the, from the customer in a, you know, that they're willing to well, in B2B, the ton of data I want is just enough to get back in touch with them. <laughs> get on the okay. phone. But I, I think the yeah. point is that the more relevant you are in what you're putting in front of the customer, the more willing they are to give you the data, yeah. even if it's just an email address, which you know you can then turn into a lot more data based, you know, using a, a myriad of different technologies. Um, but I would say, you know, I, I mean, I think the only way to actually be able to create the those relevant stories and compelling content for your customer is by doing the persona research. It doesn't have to be in depth, but you know, if if you're selling to to you know marketers like I do, um, you know, there are, there are three basic personas that we develop and then develop content against, and then determine what channels that we should be targeting them in, um, and you know, and those are social media marketers, um, digital e-commerce marketers, and so forth, and then brand marketers, and, and on top of all of that is the CMO. Um, and that's just who we sell to, but we are, we are actively thinking about where the CMO as a persona is going to go to get her information. See what I did there? Um, and, <laughs> and um, you know, versus where the VP of digital is, or e-commerce, you know, even more specifically, would go to get their information. And they are different places, and the message that we are giving to those people or the stories that we're trying to tell are different. There's definitely overlap and I you know I would encourage anyone who's doing persona research to look for the overlap when you're developing content because otherwise you'll be developing content for the rest of your lives but um, but you know really understanding who your buyer is and and what their needs are and where they sit in the organization I think is really critical in b2b marketing in, in the absence of some data can are there as you're trying to, to develop that persona are there ways to develop a proxy? A hundred percent. And can you expand on that? I mean, we, you, you look at your client base and you, and I mean, talk to your clients for starters. You know, your best clients are your next best clients. Um, so talk to your clients, understand, you know, what the value is that you bring to them, what the value is that your technology or your product brings to them. And this works in the consumer world too. You want to understand why you have a loyal buyer. You, you hope that that loyal buyer is not just fly by the night, but, you know, and certainly don't want to lose them, you know, in, at all. Um, so it, it's really taking what you have at hand and, and leveraging that. I mean, it's not, it's, not, it's not complicated. It's just, it's a lot of work and you have to do it. <laughs> it's just I guess the question becomes, how can you gather, where can you gather more data about your, your client? Uh, what other sources of, of information can actually pull in? in order to develop these personas and, and create personalized experience as you go down the road. Mm -hmm. um, just there's technology for that, but there's also just, you know, work. Yeah. Well, well, to your point, <laughs> I mean, talk to a customer. Yeah. It's not, you know, yeah. it's not rocket science. Um, Mircha, uh, as someone bringing a startup to market, um, what have you done to develop and execute uh, in terms of an integrated marketing strategy uh, with limited resources? There may be others in the room that are um, equally constrained with resources. Yeah, so I do run a small company and, and obviously with uh, limited resources. I guess, um, you know, from an omnichannel perspective, uh, we are looking at ways we can actually expand our visibility and, and create, uh, create a bigger, a broader um, um, audience basically around, around our name, around our brand. So from a go-to-market perspective, what we do, we're looking at establishing uh, very selective and exclusive partnerships with larger companies. So the B2B level, uh, which, uh, you know, such partnerships would give us tremendous exposure in front of, uh, you know, the end consumers. Uh, a few weeks ago, what we've done, we've organized an event in Toronto, and uh, I put together a number of startups 
And what we did, we opened the market, we, we rang the bell on the Toronto Stock Exchange, and that created uh, in, in great visibility uh, for all of us. All of us, we have socialized that event through our social channels uh, in order to raise awareness. It, it was the first time, actually, TSX had people in jeans and T-shirts uh, ringing the bell. First time they actually had people from uh, you know, dialing online uh, to, to such a ceremony. And one of the outcomes that, uh, uh, that, that we got after this event, uh, although, you know, uh, it was, you know, in the works, we were a actually able to uh, get a partnership with a Fortune 100 company, Oracle, that is. And through Oracle, they, they actually have um, um, one of the leading uh, publishing web tools, which is called Eddis. So Eddis has about 2.1 billion views a month, and they collect tremendous insights, customer behavior in terms of how you move from one site to another to another. I think even Digimarcom uh, uses their widget uh, on the website. So through, uh, through Eddis, we're getting tremendous exposure in terms of uh, getting people to know us, getting people to learn about Midvibe. At the same time, as I mentioned, you know, where can we look for, for data points over time through this partnership, we're gonna be able to personalize much better the Midvibe experience and, and provide personalized content, personalized events to, to our user base. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Tamar, um, what do you see as, as the top challenges uh, with the Omnichannel customer? Uh, well, I think I touched on this a little bit earlier, but I think that expectation, and I think also a little bit of what you said, Rachel, this whole idea of um, marketing automation and all this wonderful technology that we have to get more data, to put everything together, I think a lot of times we're over-engineering the process and trying to replace it with hard work and research and brainstorming and reviewing campaigns after they go live and putting in these important time slots to sit with your team, discuss what you're doing, and do quality as opposed to just trying to show up everywhere. So I, I would say for marketers, at least in my experience, that's been the biggest challenge. If you know there's this new thing we need to do, and if we try this, we'll be able to do this. But if you're not doing it well, um, if it's not all working together, if you don't have a cohesive picture, then it's time to kind of pare back and go back to basics. There's this bright, new, shiny thing. Yeah. But um, <laughs> the marketing automation, if it's not done well, or to your point, mm -hmm. not done thoughtfully, there's a risk that it becomes what I refer to as marketing autopilot. Mm -hmm. that's exactly and that's right. when there's a lot of misfires. And I don't know if you've seen or have any anecdotes. I've been in the middle of a misfire before, and that's happened, definitely. Anything you'd like to share? You nope. don't have to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no problem. Um, uh, Mercho, anything to add from your own experiences on Omnichannel? I think Starbucks, Starbucks is doing a great job in terms of, um, uh, you know, I have... Uh, I'm looking from a mobile perspective. So you have that uh, Starbucks app, and uh, let's say you want to recharge your account, and you can call them, you can recharge your account through their website or in store. So basically you have all these channels and that are converging at the mobile level. So that would be one, one easy to understand example where something actually does work. I mean, that's a good yeah. point too. We're talking about it from the perspective of reaching our consumers with a marketing mindset, but really what the world is today is, you know, every discipline needs to be available to their customer, wherever their customer is. So customer service, I mean, you, you're a perfect example, and what you just said, you know, we, it, it's, it's a digital mobile environment, and if you aren't providing the tools to your customer to be able to reach you, then you're, you're not providing an optimal experience for your customer. If I have to expand your website to read your phone exactly. number? Mm -hmm. Exactly. One of the things that actually we just started to, I don't have like actual data to give you right now. We're beginning the research of understanding, you know, all these different verticals, whether it be hospitality, you know, airlines, financial services, and how they serve their customers on social media and other digital and mobile channels. And the funny thing is, is that tech companies really don't always have such a nice social experience or customer service experience. There's a lot of dynamic knowledge bases or bots that actually don't function that well. It's really hard to get to a human to talk to them when you need to. So yeah, that's it's a very like common experience. like they rolled experience. up the drawbridge. And exactly. Don't, don't bother deflect, us. Deflect, deflect, <laughs> yeah. 
it's not only about the technology, it's about the people. Right. right? Exactly. And any article that you read about new technologies, whether it be marketing or otherwise, anything, a, any article you read on artificial intelligence or machine learning, it always talks about the human element. It doesn't exist without the human element. And what these technologies are doing is you know, creating a better environment for humans to be able to do their work more efficiently. It doesn't eliminate humans right. you know, or the human touch. And, and that's certainly true you know, of the technology that we sell to our clients. You know, we have, we, ours is completely machine, machine learning based, it's algorithmic, but we've got a team of 150 plus people who work in that every day to make it more efficient and to deliver what we need to deliver to the customer. So, can I go so far as to say more human? Yes. Yeah. It's scaling humanity. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we, we actually like uh, wrote an article entitled Why Scheduling is More Social Than You Think. So I'm trying to get a meeting with you, right? But why should I CC a robot when, in fact, I'm trying to meet you, right? right. So I need to work myself up in order to, to yeah. find the time. Yeah. Well, the, um, it was something I was talking about earlier. So I, there's a, a website or a company called x.ai, and they offer virtual assistants, uh, which I use to, to book meetings. And, I, and you could have Andrew or Amy. Oh, I elected to have Amy as my virtual assistant because Andrew would be too confusing. But um, in doing so, I email Amy and I say, Amy, would you book a meeting with my friend Bilal? Well, after some a few exchanges, Bilal actually said, Amy's really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't, want, he, he, didn't, he didn't want to deal with her That's anymore. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah. it's interesting that yeah. you know, we're, um, in, in a sense, outsourcing some human endeavors uh, and to, to the point of, of backfire. Yeah. Uh, and so I had to actually now intervene and win Bilal back over as my friend. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take that. Sorry. <laughs> exactly. I'll take that. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> um, as much as we're talking about the omni-channel customer and technology and customization and so on, um, under the umbrella of integrated marketing, it isn't just about emerging technology. It isn't just about the latest app and so on. And uh, Rachel, from your perspective, I'm wondering, what is the role <coughs> for traditional marketing? Um, is it you know, kind of a 50-50? Is it um, that, you know, even if we just talk about the fundamentals of traditional marketing, that in some cases they get replicated in, in emerging as well. I just wondered what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually think that many elements of traditional marketing are sort of back in vogue, if you will. Um, you know, particularly in enterprise marketing, where you are trying to reach a sophisticated, buyer who you know everybody is trying to reach um, and there's a lot of noise um, in the market and so you know I, we have started to use numerous different traditional marketing tactics as part of our overarching integrated marketing strategy um, and weaving it all throughout so you know everything from high touch direct mail which you know is actually quite effective in you know in this noisy world um, to picking up the phone and calling and, you know, and then interspersing that with, um, with email, which is still there, um, with driving people to websites which are personalized, um, with events, um, and, and, you know, bringing people in a room to talk to each other. Um, you know, so we are, we're very much using a mix of traditional and digital tactics in order to reach the various different buyers at an organization. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the term account-based marketing, but these are sort of the principles of, you know, what, what now has a name, but truthfully, marketers have been doing for a long time. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, there's opportunity. I don't know if it's 50-50. I, I think it really just depends on, on, you know, how you can execute it effectively. Um, I think it's probably different for different types of companies. Right. Um, but it's, it's very much a test and learn approach as well. Um, and with it comes challenges because, you know, like I said earlier, you, digital marketing is hard to, to measure effectively across the omni-channel, but add in the traditional elements with the digital elements, it, it, you know, it makes it even more challenging. I think it's still worth the endeavor and it's still worth testing and learning and we've certainly done a lot of that and, you know, feel like we are getting to a place where we can re replicate some of our successes. Um, but yeah, it's, it is a full-on mix. 
even if it's anecdotal, are you getting feedback from customers or perspective that it's refreshing to f ex have be marketed to traditionally? Yeah, I mean, I think the feedback is that we are booking meetings whereas we weren't before. So, you know, we are breaking through to the person that we are trying to get in touch with through, you know, they're, they're, it's a variety of different things. So it's the direct mail and then it's the LinkedIn view from mm -hmm. a senior person at your company, you know, and it's this sort of mix. And, and, and then it's the, the BDR calling up and saying, hey, did you get the package? And then them putting it all together. Hey, wait, I just saw the CMO of Olapic look at my LinkedIn profile, and oh yeah, I just got that really cool blah, blah, blah. So it's, you know, I, and then they take the call. Very cool. Yeah. The, uh, but building on that combination of traditional uh, and emerging, um, I'm wondering, um, just from a, a best practices or examples of where you thought it was done well, do you have an example that uh, tomorrow that you might want to share? Traditional and emerging. Um, I would say just in general, I, I can't speak, you know, I've gotten, you know, BDR emails and then a great gift card in the, you know, in the mail and I reach out to them, but it still needs to be relevant. It makes sense. So that's kind of it. So I think. So delight is not enough. Delight is not Relevant nice. delight is. Relevance is important. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably the most important thing. I would say um, for us, a big shift that I've been seeing in the B2B world, events still bring in ton of leads like you can't get away from them you're like oh we'll make everything online have everything like a just a webinar or do a podcast do whatever but it's shifting to more of an intimate space so maybe you know i don't know if this is the best venue to say it but maybe instead of investing and in going to a bigger event and spending a lot more of your budget there creating a more intimate um dinner with some of your prospects yeah. or customers, I'm finding that these actually it's the same theme, like more human experiences are showing a lot more value. So that's, you know, the most traditional, I guess, kind of marketing you could do is sit down and have a conversation. Right, bread. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. <laughs> I, either one of you have any to add from a... Uh, we've tried uh, experiences, some, tried, tried some examples, um, some some examples that we've done recently. In fact, the uh, the program is still um, rolling on right now. Again, another B two B partnership. So we partnered with uh, Gartner, and Gartner has uh, one of the most popular app review sites, and we're listed uh, part of of their website. Now, uh, what they do, uh, so this this site called Captera, they would actually send out uh, twenty five dollar. Amazon or Visa card to anyone who would actually leave a review for our app Midvibe on their website. It's a great partnership. People actually take the time to write a thoughtful review, which helps us. It helps, it helps them uh, you know, grow their content and visibility on their website. And what I would underline is you know, the, the power of cash. It actually does work. Um, cash delights. <laughs> cash delights. <laughs> Can I give um, sure. a B2C example, yeah. just so we don't leave folks out in the room? Um, so the example is actually a, a client of Olapic, um, NYX Cosmetics. So NYX Cosmetics does a really effective job of bridging online and offline marketing in order to reach their consumer. Um, they, they realized that their consumers were creating a ton of content without them involved. And you know, they, they looked for a partner in order to curate that content and start to cultivate their relationships with their consumers in a more meaningful way. Um, once they started to, to take all this content in, and it's a ton of content because they've got a ton of products and they do things by, you know, by skin color, by shade, by this, that, and the other thing. Um, they, cr they call... <laughs> they, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um, um, they, they cultivated all of this content and then they took that content and they created these digital experiences in their store in um, Times Square? Times Square? Anyone been to the next store in Times Square? No, it's this amazing immersive experience where you go in and there, you know, you can shop all their products, but you can also go up to a uh, an iPad, if you will, and type in the different SKU numbers or scan the SKU numbers, and then all of the different user-generated content comes up to show you what it could look like on this skin tone, on that skin oh, tone. On, yeah, it's, it's amazing. And then you can take a selfie and see what it looks like on you, and, 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 and it's a really good example of, creating an online experience that gets your consumers to provide you with content that you need and then reusing that content in an offline experience 
with digital elements right, um, right back in front of and, your consumers. And reflect it back to the same yeah. community that yeah. they're a part of. Very, oh, I'm close to, well, it's very impressive. we can walk over there later. Yeah. Um, I mean. in, in the few minutes remaining, uh, before we open it for questions, I just wondered if each of you would have, um, you know, beyond relevancy as an example, if, if we start with you tomorrow, the idea of uh, what recommendation you might have for an organization that's um, wanting to do integrated marketing successfully. You know, we have these issues of gaps with data. Um, we have issues of you know, the siloization sometimes of companies. Like, so curious to know what you would recommend a company's approach, whether B2C or B2B, on how to work more in a coordinated way. Um, just some thoughts on that, and we'll work our way down the, the panel. What I've had my team do for a while, we've actually been working, and again, this is not like a technology thing, it's more of an interpersonal thing. We were working on sprints, very similar to how like an engineering team would. So it'd be like a two-week period where you kind of have one campaign that you're focused on during that two-week period. So product marketing is focusing on how to align the, the product story for sales You know, with this campaign. We have the demand gen person that's getting all ads ready to go in the email marketing and the PR side and everything in that way. That's been a wonderful way to kind of align everything. And not everything will always fit this perfect little sprint editorial calendar, but to the best of our ability, that's we're kind of keeping to that discipline um, because that always leaves room for research before you start and evaluation at the end um, so that you're constantly looking at how you performed and what to do better next time. It's rapid prototyping, but you're not making such a big bet that you can't. You haven't gone too far without the opportunity to correct. Exactly, it's staying agile, but still staying the course. What are your thoughts, Rachel? So, I mean, I think I would start with agreeing on who your ideal customer is, um, and then I would sit all of the different channel owners down in a room and talk about what the goals are to reach this, or ha what, what the channels are to reach this consumer, and what the ultimate goal is across all of these channels. Um, I think the biggest challenge that marketers in big organizations have is that they sit in these silos and they don't, they're not gold the same way. They're not you know, brought into a room to talk about how this one customer is going to touch your brand in numerous different ways, and how do we make that experience consistent you know, without, you know, not, not just because we've got brand guidelines, but because, you know, we are telling a story throughout all these different touch points. So, you know, I think it's sort of back to basics. Get in a room together and talk about who you're trying to reach and what are the many different ways that you can reach them. Is there an element of rationalization of the channels, too? It may not be For that sure. we have to have all the channels? 100%. Or? Okay. Yeah. Well, it goes back to something we were talking about before as well. Um, I have a colleague that when talking to a, a company about their you know, customer facing, all the different customer facing uh, resources they have will ask one question. And they'll say, if I ask the following question of everyone that's customer facing, will I get the same answer? And that's a great test. Can you post the same thing to Twitter, to Facebook, or to your contact form on your website, or to your call center, and you ask the same question and, and uh, just document what the answers are. And if, if, to your point, if the consistency breaks down, um, then you know, lessons learned. I wonder what your thoughts are, Mircha. Well, um, I think you're, you're right in, in you know, making the assumption that you will get different answers, right? Because LinkedIn is different than uh, Twitter, Facebook is different than my website, and, and you know, the attention span is different. Um, I would, I would, you know, go back and pretty much as, as you you name it, uh, Rachel, account account based marketing, right? Um, I would, I would start um, pretty much, you know, from from a marketing funnel perspective. You have three stages: the awareness, interest, and then call to action. So the call to action should always be a relationship, right? There's there there should be a relationship at the other end. So it's up to you how to how do you define that relationship, how you want to to shape that relationship as you go forward, um, both in the B2B space, both in, to, in, the, in the B2C space. Great, thank you. So um, I want to open it to the floor. Do any of you have any questions for any member of the panel? Yes. Um, I'm just wondering, <laughs> I guess wondering if you have any tips for that and how you can involve other departments do you do that at the end, or do you get them involved during the ideation? And just a little bit about the so process. So first of all, I mean, there's different tools. 
not to over uh, <laughs> technology. <laughs> I use Trello. I really like Trello um, as a like project management tool. So we use that. And actually, I have the head of design sits in on this meeting as well. And each team member is kind of responsible for bringing in intel from different parts of the organization. So one of the marketers um, is responsible for customer marketing. Another one, the product manager, obviously, is bringing in information from product and PR, obviously, whoever's handling that, which would be me, um, and the sales side as well. So it's more that each person has a responsibility to bring in information from the rest of the organization so that we're not um, living in our little marketing bubble. Does the, having the head of design in, in the meeting help so that they don't feel blindsided? Yeah, I it's think more that's, collaborative. It's like a typical pain point, right? Is yeah. that design often feels like they get bombarded with things and they don't understand actually what the purpose of it is or what you're looking to accomplish. So I think if they're if they're, if it's possible to have them in the beginning of the conversation, then it saves a lot of time and iterations further down. And grief. Yeah, yeah I would <laughs> second that. Yeah. I just had that conversation yesterday. Other questions? I'll give you the last five minutes or three minutes of your afternoon back. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.